Welcome, Gun Runner. Some of you believe your system is the most advanced in the universe. Let's review the numbers. Sega Genesis is 16 bits. 3DO was 32 bits. The Atari Jaguar is 64 bits. Which is more advanced? Clifford! Hmm? 16 and 32 are less than 64. So with 64 bits, 3D graphics, real world animation, and lightning speed that you can only get with Jaguar, which is more advanced? Clifford! Can you repeat the question? Jaguar! 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 Everybody, Kieran A. Cadillard here. And for this video, um, I'm doing something a bit special. And uh, it's something that I've been asked to do for quite some time as well. And uh, the reasons for that are because, number one, I've just hit uh, 2,000 subscribers. So as a way of celebrating, I thought I would do something um, a bit special something with a bit of meaning so that's why um, I'm doing this video today and also because I keep getting asked to do this video constantly get asked this video and people are always surprised when I tell them that I haven't done this video so I did want to um, do it for a special occasion and I knew I had 2,000 subscribers uh, benchmark coming up so I wanted to do it for that so to all my um, subscribers out there thank you for subscribing and uh, I'm uh, really glad you're enjoying the content on my channel and uh, onwards and upwards and I hope you enjoy um, what I've got planned um, for the rest of uh, this year. So what I'm going to do here is, I mean this is strictly going to be a system review. I don't want to go massively into the history of the system because if I go into big time into the history of the Jaguar I will literally be here forever because it's such a windy interesting story. If people would like to see a separate video on the history of the Jaguar, I'm happy to do that because I don't feel that there's um, many good ones out there. I mean, I saw the Nostalgia Nerds one recently and uh, for everything he got right, he got he got lots of things wrong. And uh, it does uh, annoy me that, that a lot of people don't research these um, videos properly and, and, and just um, keep repeating the same things they've read in magazines that, especially where the Jaguar is concerned, often aren't true. So I don't so I don't want to go too much of the history. That is something I could do in another video. Um, otherwise, I recommend reading the article I did for the Jaguar's uh, 20th anniversary um, a few years back in Retro Gamer because I did cover it in quite a lot of detail in that. But what I actually literally am going to be doing here is reviewing the system and showing you a few of its games. I'm just going to stick in a few little clips of games. Um, it's not going to be a rundown of my, my favourite titles or anything like that. Again, this is something I could do in another video if people wanted to see it. So what we are doing here is just literally reviewing the Jaguar console itself. And I should also mention I'm not going to be covering the Jaguar CD. Again, that is something I will probably do in a separate video because I do have a Jaguar CD. I'm lucky enough to own one. I still have my original one from 1995. So that is something I can do in a separate video. So the Jaguar itself. Now I will give you a, br a very a very little brief bit of history here, um, just just to, to to where it came from. So it was released in 1993 in uh, North America. Um, it didn't get its proper worldwide world worldwide release until 1994 because of massive supply problems with the manufacturer IBM. Only, I think it was 2,000 units were released into the UK in 1993. I was lucky enough to grab one of those original units, having pre-ordered it from Telegames. So I have my Jag from the very, very, very beginning. But those first um, lot of months in 1993 were pretty tough for me because uh, nowhere had games. Um, so the only way I could order them was from um, from Telegames. And, and, that, and the games were quite slow in coming as well initially so it wasn't until 1994 that it really um, got going as a console anyway initially introduced to compete with the Mega Drive and SNES and that's the way it was advertised despite what a lot of people seem to claim um, as it was released we also saw a couple of other competitors come along the CD32 just before it from um, Commodore and the 3DO around the same time which um, 
It was manufactured by several people, including Panasonic and Goldstar. It was the Jag's main competitor as the 3DO. They came out around the same time. The 3DO was using 32-bit technology, but it was a next-gen 3D games console, which is technically what the Jaguar was in many ways. But the differences were 3DO was um, extortionally expensive, about £800 um, when it was launched over here, where the Jaguar was, I believe, uh, if I seem to remember, it was £229.99 uh, in the UK initially. Uh, came down to 200 not a long time after that. But um, it was pretty very good value for money compared to the competition. So let's look at the obviously the Jaguar itself. Um, I think the design is brilliant. Um, it's a beautiful design. It got a lot of um, positive reception for its design. Actually, the, the console was very positively received to start with. Um, everyone said it looked sleek and sexy and uh, had great looks. And I think that still stands today. I still think it's one of the the best looking consoles. Um, ever, um, not just from Atari, who I mean, Atari did generally produce very nice looking consoles. They did a great job with this kind of dark grey um, colour, the red Jaguar logo, and obviously proudly proclaiming 64 bit interactive multimedia system, which we'll go into in a bit. There we've got um, our power button on the front, that's all you need on there. Um, it's green, the light is green if it's power, blue, and red if it's NTSC, I believe. Um, if I remember rightly, obviously this is a power machine. Um, on the front, we have our two uh, joypad sockets. And interesting thing about the Jag is that although they're the same shape as the traditional Atari 9 uh, D9 sockets, as they were called, um, it obviously has a lot more pins because of the Jaguar controllers needing them. So this is, I think it was the only other Jaguar... I think it was the only other Atari system actually, apart from the um, 5200 that didn't have the uh, traditional Atari uh, D D9s. Uh, these these were actually first seen on the Atari STE and then the Atari Falcon, so they were the same sockets that were used on those. Cartridge slot obviously on the top. A lot of people bemoaned the fact that the um, cartridge slot doesn't have a cover. Um, so it's easy to get dust in there. And it is somewhat of a problem with the Jag because I tend to usually leave a cartridge plugged in, which solves that. But um, the, the the red screen of death, as many people call it, which is what happens when you turn on the Jag and it's either the cartridge is dirty or the slot is dirty, you get this red screen. Um, it's a bane because, um, I say, it's too easy for dirt to get in there. So what I do is... is um, it says I just leave a cartridge in there which solves that. A lot of people buy dust covers um, and there are a lot of people out there who make uh, dust covers for these machines. So there we go. So let's have a look at the, 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 the back of the console. So on the back, um, power socket obviously. Now one thing I want to mention about the power socket is that the Jaguar's power socket is in, it, it, although it looks like a regular normal power supply socket, it used reverse polarity and if you plugged in the wrong power supply into the Jaguar, it would literally fry um, the power controller inside the Jag and it would not work. There are so many Jaguars out there that are fried and you quite often find them on eBay um, because of people using the wrong power supply. It is quite easy to fix. Um, there's plenty of guides online. I actually myself um, have a guide that I wrote on uh, Mark Fixes Stuff um, website. So... You think you can get it from there if you do want to find out how to re how to repair that fault. Um, the chip is is easy to find. Um, the chip that you need to repair the Jaguar. And uh, if you've got some soldering skills, or you know somebody with a few soldering skills, then uh, it's an easy easy fix. Um, also on the back here, the standard RS socket on the other side. Or oh, I should just mention with the power socket as well. 
I would only recommend using a Jaguar power supply. People ask this a lot. Only use a Jaguar power supply. And a lot of people will tell you that the Mega Drive 1 power supply works fine. Um, yes, it does, except the Jaguar, so the Jaguar is 9 volt, the Mega Drive is 10 volt. So I would not recommend using a Mega Drive power supply for any length of time because the voltage is actually too high. So I would only recommend using a, an official Jaguar power supply. They're not hard to find. They're easy to pick up. You can go and buy one from Telegames. I'm sure they're easy to find on eBay, but Telegames have loads of stock of them. Um, European, UK ones, American ones. So if you need a Jaguar power supply, hit up Telegames or Best Electronics actually if you're in the US because they have them as well. And um, yeah, don't use other power supplies. Simple as that. Just use an official Jaguar one. They're not hard to find. In the middle here, we have the DSP and the AV socket. Now, the AV there is for connecting up a SCART cable. Um, the official Jaguar one is quite expensive now, the Peritel cable, as it's called. Uh, but they're, they're, they're very heavily shielded and they're very nicely made. So they are well worth buying. But you can get some quite decent um, homemade and third-party ones out there, um, which will do a job. Because I do not recommend ever using RF with the Jaguar because the RF picture on the Jag is absolutely terrible. And I cannot emphasize enough the difference between SCART on the Jaguar and RF is like night and day. I've never seen such a huge difference on any console I've ever experienced. It is unbelievable. I mean, there are games where actually that use like transparencies in the graphics on the SCART cable you can see them on the RF cable it just is like a fuzzy fuzziness um, so it really just doesn't do the graphics justice at all you can get composite cables as well and S video cables in the US um, but SCART is the way to go SCART gives you by far the best picture um, other things that were you can plug into the back of there there's a cat box um, there's other versions of that. There's a scat box. There's another one that's called something different, which you can plug in the back of here, which gives like audio out, so you can connect it up to a hi-fi and stuff like that. Because obviously the Jaguar did have stereo surround sound. So there are audio things that you can take advantage of. The only problem being is with a lot of these boxes is if they're plugged in, you can't plug the SCART cable in. So there's uh, there's some trade-offs there to be had with, with, with using those. But I believe there are people, there is someone who's developed now one you can plug in the back that still has the SCART connection on it. So um, uh, that's worth looking out for. I think that's literally only just been developed. So what is there else to say about the Jaguar? Uh, not a lot. Let's have a look at the back. Uh, standard stuff, really. Your serial number. Um, obviously, it was made in the USA. That was something that Atari bigged up massively, that they made their consoles in the USA. And they were very proud of that. As I alluded to earlier, they are built by IBM. But uh, actually, in hindsight... It's something that they probably shouldn't have done um, because they could have brought the price down a bit by manufacturing in China. And in all honesty, no one seemed to care at all that the Jaguar was made in the US, which is a bit of a shame um, because it was it was supposed to be a massive selling point for the console. So that's the the, the actual Jaguar it's, it, itself. And um, next we'll we'll have a look at the controllers. <laughs> Okay, the controllers. So first of all, the standard Jaguar controller, the one that came with the machine, uh, the much maligned uh, three button Jag pad. And uh, these get a lot of hate, um, which I think is actually completely unwarranted. And elsewhere on my channel, you will actually find a, uh, a video where I do compare the Jaguar controllers. So that's um, something that, that's just worth looking out for. I might even link it on the video actually for you so you can click on that if you want to take a look. But this is the original three button controller. It's a pretty standard um, eight way joypad, three buttons, CBA. Why they 
put them in that order. A lot of people said, said that it's stiff but couldn't be asked. Um, pause option buttons, standard, and the keypad, the much maligned keypad at the bottom with its uh, numbers one to nine, zero, star, and hash. Um, back, you'll see there's molded hand grips, your serial number. The back of my controller's a little bit dirty, actually. Um, and you get you get you got a decently long cable. It has to be said, um, a bane of, of a lot of people is is systems that don't have long cables. But this one is more than long enough to stretch from the TV to your sofa. Now, what a lot the, the chief complaints with these controllers was that people said that the buttons and joy are a little bit mushy. I don't think they're too bad actually, um, but a lot of people claim that they're too big and unwieldy. Now, I have got small hands for a guy. Um, I'm not ashamed to say. I've always had small hands, and in my past, it's actually caused me problems because I used to play uh, semi-professionally as a uh, as a goalkeeper, play football semi-professionally, should I add, as a goalkeeper, and I always struggled to find professional gloves um, that fitted my hand. I would have to mail order them usually from special places because my hands, um, a lot of gloves didn't come in a size for my hand um, because. That size of my hand is actually a child size and not an adult size. Um, so I always struggled with that, uh, which was annoying. So, I mean, and I have no problem, even with my small hands, as you can see, gripping it and getting to the buttons. Absolutely none whatsoever. So anyone who says they're too big, um, that's complete nonsense, really. Absolute nonsense. A lot of people say the, joy, the, the keypad is awkward. It's not really. Watch me move. I can move my fingers to the, the buttons easily from there. And uh, we'll have a look at one of the keypad overlays because I, I have got some here. So I'll just grab one so I can show you how they work. So here's one for Doom. Let's grab that. That will That's as good as anything. So you can see that the keypad overlays have these little um, plastic bits on each side. So all you literally do is, is, is slot them in like this. That's it. There's little holes on each side. You slot them in. They cover. And Doom is actually a very good example of the usefulness of the keypad. I hate it when people slack it off because for certain games, it is so useful. And uh, Doom is a great example because this obviously allows you to just change weapons on the fly. No pressing a button to get to the, the, the weapon you want. You just go, OK, BFG, OK, rocket launcher, machine gun, shotgun, punch. You can just quickly change on the fly. Also, in all games, um, holding down those two buttons resets it. And the zero button usually turns off the uh, the uh, music, um, but also you could you could actually use your adjust the sounds within the games by pausing them actually as well. So they they just slot in like that. And the other great thing, of course, is that even for games that didn't have keypad overlays, um, which not all did, you could either make well you could just make your own overlays as as I actually have done in the past. I've actually got one that I made some years ago here. So just have a, a little look. Um, so, for example, I made one for theme park because, and all I did was I just, I, I literally just stuck that to a bit of cardboard that so you could laminate it. But um, it's easy just to make your own. Um, anyone can make their own. Although there is actually quite, um, quite a few people now who make um, these overlays for, for games that didn't get them. And actually, that one I see I made for theme parks because theme park really, really needs one because every button does something and gives you a shortcut. So it makes playing the game a hell of a lot easier. Why theme park didn't come with the overlay, I don't know. I'm only guessing because it's a third party game and Ocean um, couldn't be bothered to make an overlay. But the overlays are, are very useful in a lot of games and that's why the keypad, I'd hate not to have the keypad because it adds a lot to the gameplay experience despite what some people might say. And as I say, these are pretty good comfortable controllers. But we did get a Pro Controller, which I say I have done a review looking at the Pro Controller and comparing it to the normal controller. This came much later. These are like hen's teeth now. They go for stupid money. They're really hard to pick up. Um, I used to have two of them, and then I actually got one of mine stolen at an event, which was great. Um, I was pretty annoyed about that um, because they now go for such stupid money. And you see these are thinner. Um, is what, one of the main things. The buttons are much nicer, they're much clickier, much more responsive. Shoulder buttons, and I should add that the shoulder buttons and Z, Y, and X, if I remember rightly, they the shoulder buttons match, I think it's seven and nine, 
and Z Y X match. I think it's four five six. So I might be wrong on that, but it's, it's something like that. And that's that's so it's basically if you don't have a pro controller, you can still play games that were made for the pro, pro controller because quite a few were like. Double Dragon 5 would be an example because it's a fighting game. It needs six buttons. Primal Rage is the same. But you could use the keypad buttons as the extra buttons if you didn't have a Pro Controller. Or I think you can use Option to switch them as well, um, these buttons. So I think that, that was one of the ways of doing it. But the Pro Controller is essential for some games. Another game worth mentioning is Atari Carts because you can use the shoulder buttons to handbrake turn, which was great. Um, around corners, it gave you better turning. So some games, these shoulder buttons are... Essential switching bases and missile command was another good use of it as well. But that's the pro controller. Very hard to find, very expensive, but very much worth it because they're they're far superior to the uh, original controllers. There was also a light gun planned for the Jaguar um, that never came out for use with games like Mad Dog McCree, and none of the light gun games ever came out. Although people have developed their own sort of homebrew mock-up ones, and there is a homebrew game out there um, that was made by Mateus Domin that can be used with a light gun. There were also various other controllers. There was a, a flight stick that was made for the Jaguar, which I, do, I don't have. That was a third-party item. They're very, very hard to find. And uh, a lot of people have made their own kind of homebrew versions of controllers as well. And someone actually did indeed make a adapter so you could plug a PlayStation 1 controller into the Jaguar as well. Um, so there are different controller options out there. You don't have to use the, the standard Jaguar joypads at all if you don't want to and that's that's the controllers so have a look a little look at um, the games cartridges next The games cartridge has had a nice design. You see this kind of curved top um, embossed with the, the Atari logos on the back. There was no flap or anything on the bottom. The cartridges were, were open, which did mean they got dirty quite easily. Nice color labels, and they fit nicely with the design of the system. The only problem being with these is that um, they don't have any end label, which is quite annoying there are people who've made actually strips of labels that you can buy um that stick on but they peel off quite easily so they don't actually work particularly well but you can get labels that you can stick along the tops of the cartridge you can actually order a whole set that includes every jaguar game and uh, some of the games don't have the entire emboss like this one because theme park is a third party game so it doesn't have the atari logo on the back although there are some third party games that still do um and uh these cartridges um, could hold up to, I believe it's six megabytes uncompressed, but the compression on the Jaguar could go up to something like 14 to one or something crazy like that. So the Jaguar games could actually be much bigger than the, um, than the specified cartridge size, which is something very different to the Mega Drive and SNES before it because the Jaguar had hardware decompression built into it. So it could compress on the fly which was very, very useful for the system. I will actually be doing another video at some point um, where I look at all the games, similar to a Lynx one I did, where I actually looked at the, the whole of the Lynx uh, commercial library. And I will do something very, very similar for the Jaguar, where I go through and give a brief review of each game. There was also lots of other bits and pieces available um, to go with the Jaguar. At the back, you can see my Jaguar T-shirt. There was a whole range of stuff called Jagware, um, clever, um, alteration of the name there clever play on the word Jaguar and they did bum, bum bags they did baseball caps teacups um, hold, hold, hold stool bags all, all sorts of stuff um, uh, I've got one of the t-shirts and that's all I have got um, but I'm pleased to have it um, I do have been known to wear it to events <laughs> 
So uh, they are very, very smart because that whole Jaguar logo with the eyes and everything looked fantastic. But there are a lot of people who, who make um, the t-shirts themselves now, I believe, as well. But um, it's always good to have the original t-shirts as well. But the Jaguar stuff is pretty hard to find because not many people bought it back then. So another, again, that's like a big, big collector's piece with the Jaguar. And that's one of the things with the Jag that the systems have become quite expensive to buy. I mean, in UK money, you're probably you're probably looking now at 100 easy for a, an unboxed Jaguar. And you're probably looking more 150 for a box one, 200 pounds if it's in really good condition. And the games, I mean, really, you're not going to find box games now for much cheaper than, say, 20, 25 quid. You'll probably find some of the the uh, the less rare titles like Dragon Bruce Lee Story um, is, is quite a common one for some reason. Iron Soldier is quite a common one. Uh, Crescent Galaxy, some of that stuff you might find for 20, 25 pounds, maybe boxed. But... If you're going to collect for the Jaguar, you're going to need big money because you'll find that a lot of the games are going closer to the 100 mark. Stuff like Rayman is now fetching well over 100, and obviously that's one of the most iconic games on the Jaguar. Um, Atari Carts is another one that goes for big money, and a lot of other stuff like the, like the Iron Soldier 2 cartridge um, goes, for, goes for big money too, mainly a lot of the later releases. So it's worth noting that I often see vastly inflated auctions for a lot of the Teddy game stuff that stuff like Towers 2, Sensible Soccer, um, what else did Teddy Games do? Worms, Zero Five, stuff like that. All of those titles can still be ordered directly from Teddy Games. Don't go paying £300 for a copy of Towers 2 on eBay, like I've seen somebody do recently, when you can go to Teddy Games and I think it's 70 quid to buy from them brand new. Not even second hand, brand new. They still produce the games to order. Um, they still have quite a lot of stock of new games as well. So if you want to avoid eBay, then and if you're in, especially if you're in Europe, then telegames.co.uk is a great option. If you're in the US, then probably your best option apart from eBay is my Atari. Um, they have the best best stock of Jaguar games. And uh, it's also, I should add at this point with the games, games are multi-region for the Jaguar. There is no region locking. The Jaguar auto detects 50 or 60 hertz and plays accordingly. So you can buy games from any region and they will work on your Jaguar. There's only a couple of exceptions to that, but they are on the Jaguar CD, so it's not worth mentioning. All cartridge games will work on your Jaguar. Actually, there are a couple of homebrews that I think that, that didn't. I think believe Blackout, for example, um, cartridge was NTSC only, but the CD version will work on both. But... Out of the commercial library, everything will work on any machine. And a lot of people go on about the um, the 50, 60 hertz thing, the NTSC PAL. You can mod Jaguars quite easily to, to switchable if you like modding. I, I'm not a fan of modding original hardware, especially when it's quite rare in the first place. But in all honesty, it's not particularly worth it because the thing to remember with the Jaguar is a huge amount of its games, in fact, the vast majority of its library was developed in Europe. So they were PAL optimized from the very, very start. So you don't actually get very much um, extra from playing them on an NTSC machine. Many of the Jaguar's best games, for example, Super Burnout, which runs a solid 60 frames per second throughout the game, you know, was developed by a French team. So, you know, you're not gonna get really any advantage out of playing that on an NTSC machine. It's completely PAL optimized at 60 frames per second. And there are some some bargains. I mean, that's that's a good one to mention. Actually, Super Burnout in terms of um, picking up some Jaguar games. And thankfully, um, Tempest Two Thousand, Doom, titles like that can still be had fairly cheaply compared to the rest of the library. Iron Soldier is another. They'd be prepared to pay quite big money now for Alien vs Predator, which is obviously one of the Jaguar's uh, kind of most iconic games. So, is the Jaguar worth buying? Um, of course it is, uh, most definitely, and uh, I think uh, I should probably uh, give you some reasons why.
So in my mind, there's lots of reasons to collect for the Jaguar. One, it has a very interesting and diverse library. There's a lot of genres missing and there's some genres that are overcompensated. For example, I always found it strange that the Jaguar has three basketball games. But there's, for example, no baseball game. So there are certain sports that are well covered, certain sports that aren't. The Jaguar's got a couple of football games, a couple of American football games. But then there's no wrestling game, there's no boxing game. So there are genres that are good and genres that are bad. There's no scrolling beat-em-ups, but there's plenty of fighters. Those fighters are all the rage at that point. If you're into your RPGs, then the Jaguar isn't a machine for you because there's literally no RPGs, probably other than Towers 2. There's not really anything on there that you're going to like. If you're a fan of, of, of sort of those early kind of 3D first-person style games, lots of them on the Jaguar. Great selection of them, in fact. You've got, some really, you've got some really good games in those categories like Doom and Alien vs. Predator, Eye War, um, and, you know, also shoot em ups If you like shoot em ups there's some great stuff on the Jaguar. You've got Raiden, um, there's Protector SE, there's Defender 2000, there's Tempest 2000, Missile Command 3D. The, the, the remade, the 2000 stuff, is generally excellent. Also, from a historical point of view, this was the last games console to be designed in the UK, designed by Flare Technology, that was manufactured by Atari, and of course on that it was the last Atari console, although the Atari box looks set to change that, that's just been released. But until then, the Jaguar is the last Atari console. In many ways it still is, because after this, Atari Corp merged with GTS, the name was sold on to Hasbro, the Nintendo programs, and it's really just become a name rather than being the actual Atari. This was built by the same company, you know, Atari Corp was still based in the same building at Sunnyvale. You know, it, it was part of the same family, you know, it, it, it was part of that same succession that started with the, the 2600. And another reason um, with the Jaguar and, and its games, there's a lot of historical stuff there in terms of the games. Because you've got titles like Any Mrs. Predator, which was what put Rebellion on the map and Rebellion are massive these days now they own the 2000 AD franchise they've just released stuff like Battlezone VR for PlayStation 4 they started on the Jaguar the first Rayman game was on the Jaguar we've got the first console port of, of Doom there on the Jaguar there's lots of teams that started making Jaguar games high voltage software became quite a high a well known name after doing stuff for the Jaguar. Jeff Minter obviously did stuff for the Jaguar. There's not many consoles that he produced games for, um, especially not previous to them. I don't think he'd done anything on a console um, previous to the Jaguar. So there's lots of stuff there from a great historical point of view. And it's because the, the library actually isn't that big, it, it isn't that difficult. Although you need to spend quite a lot of money, it isn't that difficult to complete uh, a commercial collection for the Jaguar. We're not talking hundreds and hundreds of titles like the, the Super Nintendo and the SNES. It's a really interesting, quirky system. It's well known that I'm a fan of the Jaguar. I mean, that goes back to to owning one when I was younger. But um, it's still a system that I have a lot of pleasure for, and a lot of time for, and a lot of, get, gain a lot of pleasure from to this day. You know, I have the Jaguar Sector 3 Facebook group, so if you do want to find out more about the Jaguar, come and join us there. It's also worth mentioning with the Jaguar, the Jaguar Sector 3 group, we've even got lots of the old Atari guys in there. I mean, we've got people like Leonard Trammell in there, Jeff Minter's in there, uh, Daryl Steele from Atari UK's in there. We've got guys from Imagitech Design in there. We've got guys from Ocean in there. We've got guys who worked on Super Burnout and, and the French team's in there. We have literally got pretty much anyone and everyone out there um, who worked on the Jaguar guys from High Voltage, oh, I could go on and on and on. And a lot of the, the homebrew guys are in there as well. Um, so you can always come along and get advice on, on how to program the Jaguar as well. And we've got a huge archive on Jaguar Sector 3 as well of magazine scans, technical documents, interviews, um, prototype ROMs of uh, games that weren't released. We've helped uncover a few games that have never been seen before. And that's the thing with the Jaguar. Another reason is that it keeps on surprising us. People keep finding more games that weren't released. We keep discovering new things about it all the time. 
it, it's a machine that keeps on giving and, and also a homebrew community is, is, is pretty incredible for a machine that was such a dismal failure in its commercial lifetime. I mean, it only sold around 230,000 uh, systems, which is, which is nothing um, really compared to the other machines that were around at the time, when we're talking like 40 million for the, for the Mega Drive and SNES, for example. And the homebrew community is so vibrant. There's so many new games coming out all the time on both cartridge and CD. And the great thing about the CD unit is that you can burn your own CDs to use with it. So it's a system that's carried on being supported. So, you know, if you, you can, if you own a Jaguar, you can still go and buy new games. And these new games are coming out all the time. I mean, we've seen games recently released, like um, the latest one is uh, Fast Food 64, which is a fantastic update of Fast Food from the Atari 2600, if you remember that, with new Jaguar game modes, including a Jaguar VR mode and uh, all sorts of things like that. Uh, and uh, I highly recommend picking up um, Fast Food 64 by Wave One, Wave 21 Games, I think it is. Um, really good. The program of that, again, is in the Jaguar Sector 3 group, and he's discussed his development of that game in there quite a lot. And there's there's other new stuff um, being being worked on all the time. And uh, I've, I've also, I mean, I released uh, a, a CD, some CD stuff myself for the Jaguar, uh, some of which you can buy in the group as well. So, there's so much out there still for the Jaguar. It's still going. It's still going strong. I mean, it's it's for all its criticism, for all its hate on the internet, it's like the Jaguar refuses to die. It refuses to back down. Uh, it's still there. It's still going strong. It's still having new games released. And in all honesty, if, if you if you collect retro game systems, if you're into your retro game, if you like to collect classic systems, then the Jaguar really is a machine you should have in your library. Um, for all the reasons I've already listed and many more. So thank you for watching my review of the Jaguar. Hope you enjoyed watching. I will say be back with some more Jaguar related videos soon. I've got lots planned uh, for the Jaguar because these Jaguar videos seem to go down really, really well. I will be doing a review of the Jaguar CD. I'll be doing a review of the uh, all the games um, out there for the Jaguar. And if people want to see it, I will also do a, uh, a video looking at the history of the Jaguar um, in more detail so you can learn more about um, what went wrong and why is probably the best way to put it because it's not a, an easy story to explain so as always thanks for watching um, please give us a like uh, subscribe if you haven't already and uh, I'll back, be back with a new video very soon thanks for watching bye bye